All right, criminology, welcome to chapter one. What is criminology? Understanding crime and criminals. So first we want to start with the difference between terms like crime, deviance, and delinquency. So deviant behavior is human activity that violates social norms. Okay. Now, not all deviance is against the law. Social norms are just customary ways of behavior. So dressing inappropriately for the place you're in. Also, some types of behavior may be illegal, but neither deviant nor abnormal. So take, for example, undocumented workers. It's also important to note that while that is illegal, it's not criminal. That's actually a civil infraction. Now, delinquency is the violation of the criminal law by someone under the age, by someone who is a minor, usually under the age of 18, but in some states it's as young as 16 or 17. It also includes what's called status offenses. These are offenses that are only illegal for children, things like running away from home, being incorrigible, and drinking alcohol. Now here we can kind of see that there we've got deviant behavior, illegal behavior, and then behavior that overlaps both. Now, what should be criminal? What is a crime is different from the question, what is criminal? Now, there's generally agreement that behaviors like murder, rape, burglary, theft should be against the law. Other things like abortion, gay marriage, drug use, gambling, prostitution, and gun ownership, there's less agreement about. So how we answer these questions can be found in two viewpoints of the law, one or models of the law. One is the consensus model, and the other is referred to as a conflict model, although your book is referring to it as a pluralistic perspective. Now, the consensus model says that things become illegal because society has come to a consensus that those behaviors are unacceptable, that those laws are necessary. This model is much more applicable to homogenous societies where um, people's backgrounds are very similar. They have shared values, norms, and beliefs. Now, the conflict model basically says that behaviors are typically criminalized through a political process. And usually the law is a tool that's used by those in power in order for them to maintain their power and that that also subjugates those who are less powerful. So what do criminologists do? A criminologist is someone who studies crime, criminals, and criminal behavior. I am a criminologist. This is usually people who are academics, researchers, and policy analysts. Um, generally, these folks hold a doctoral degree. I have a PhD in criminology and justice studies. Many teach in universities and colleges and do research. Now, some are strictly researchers and might work for a federal agency or a private organization. A criminalist is someone who specializes in collecting and examining physical evidence. And a criminal justice professional are all the folks that work in the criminal justice system. Police officers, COs, probation and parole officers, attorneys, judges, etc. So here we see some examples of jobs in criminalistics. And then some examples of jobs that are criminal justice professionals. And as you can see, while many people often think, oh, you're majoring in criminal justice, you must want to be a police officer, there's actually a wide array of jobs available in this field. So what is criminology then? Criminology is an interdisciplinary profession. So it's built um, and has roots in a variety of different fields. It studies crime and criminal behavior how that manifests itself, what causes it, legal aspects and control of it. It's generally referred to as the study of the law making, law breaking, and reactions to law breaking. Criminology then contributes to the discipline of criminal justice, which is really looking at how the criminal law is applied to the criminal justice system. Now, theoretical criminology tries to offer explanations for criminal behavior. So instead of just describing Here's how many murders there are. Here's who's likely to commit them. It's trying to explain why that happens. And there's many theories that have been developed over time to explain and understand crime. Now, ideally, a theory should have a set of clearly stated propositions that suggest relationships and sometimes causal relationships between different things. Now, a general theory would attempt to explain most forms of criminal conduct using one cause, one single approach. 
There is a general theory of crime, um, but it doesn't actually really explain all criminal offending. Now, another thing we often talk about in criminology is integrated theories. How can we draw from the most powerful aspects of different theories and pull them together in order to come up with a better theory that explains criminal offending? Now, crime doesn't occur in a vacuum. Crime is a social construction, and each crime has its own unique set of causes, consequences, and participants. And even victims of the same criminal act may be affected differently. Crime also then provokes reactions, which can lead to new laws or social policy. So if you're familiar with the Michelle Carter case, Michelle Carter was convicted a couple years ago in Massachusetts. Her boyfriend Connor committed suicide and she was convicted of involuntary manslaughter because she goaded him into it. Okay, now this has led to a proposal for a new law called Connor's Law, which has not been passed in Massachusetts yet. But that law is aiming to criminalize that actual behavior of encouraging someone to commit suicide. And if you want to learn more about that case, there's an excellent two-part documentary on HBO called I Love You Now Die. Now, crime, as I said, is a social construction, and it also has a measurable cost and many different causes. Different people in different groups can also interpret law-breaking behavior differently. So because of this, many criminologists look at social relativity. This is the idea that social events are interpreted differently according to the cultural experiences and personal interests of the observer, the recipient, or the initiator of that behavior. Basically, crime means different things to offenders, victims, police, and criminologists. Now, as I mentioned, criminology is interdisciplinary. It's considered primarily a social science, but it draws on many other disciplines. Now, the primary focus is sociology and sociological theories, um, and that's where the basis of many modern theories are. What, uh, what impact does society have that leads to crime, uh, to criminal behavior? And you can see here some of the many different disciplines that contribute to criminology. Philosophy, biology, psychology, obviously is probably the one that makes the most sense. Ethics, economics, political science, all play a role in criminology. So as far as counting crime goes, how do we know how much crime we have? And let's start by thinking about where we might use crime statistics. Well, we use them to evaluate programs that already exist. How effective are the police? How effective is the Boys and Girls Club? How effective are uh, speed traps? We use them to design new crime control policies. We use them when we're developing requests for funding from the government and to plan new laws. But which crime should be included or excluded is really a reflection of what a particular policymaker's interests are. Now, it's difficult to determine how much crime occurs each year, and many never even come to the attention of the criminal justice system. On average, there's more than more than half of all violent crimes are unreported to the police. And that's often referred to as the dark figure of crime, because then when we're looking at police data, we're missing all the crimes that the police don't know about. So why don't the police know? Why don't people report? Well, you may be a victim of a crime and not even know what's occurred. It could be that the person who's victimized you is a family member, a friend, or an acquaintance. You might think it's not worth reporting. Maybe the value of something that was stolen from you um, isn't very high, or you think you won't get uh, much of a response. You may fear retaliation. You may also have been committing a crime, and you may not trust the police. Now, we've got three sources for crime data. We have official statistics victimization surveys, and self-report surveys. So let's look at each of these. And please note that your slides have much more detailed information than your book does, and you are responsible for that information. So official statistics. The first set of official statistics we have is the UCR program. UCR stands for Uniform Crime Report, and it's, got, it's made up of four main data collections. The actual UCR, NIBRS, which we're gonna talk about separately, law enforcement officers killed and assaulted, and the hate crime statistics program. So we're gonna focus on the actual UCR summary reporting system. 
So in 1930, Congress authorizes the Attorney General to survey crime in America, and they designate the FBI as the agency that's going to be in charge of implementing this program. Now, the, the UCR is designed so that you can compare compare things over time um, using a crime and, and compare things against each other by using a crime index. And that index includes eight major offenses, four crimes against people and four crimes against property. Crimes against people include murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. And property crimes include burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson. Would like to make two quick notes here, though. Robbery is also a property crime, and robbery and burglary are different from each other. A robbery is the taking of something from someone, from an individual, with either force or threat of force. So it's both a property and a personal crime. Burglary is the breaking and entering of a dwelling, with the intent to commit a felony inside. You don't have to actually commit the felony and the felony doesn't have to be a theft. So if someone breaks into your house to beat you up, that is an aggravated assault and a burglary. Also, arson data while collected by the UCR is not very good. And if you wanted to study arson, you'd really wanna use some data from fire departments instead. So the UCR reports a crime rate. That's the number of crimes per 100,000 people. This allows us to compare data over time. Is the rate going up or down? And to compare different locations that might have very different populations. Now, an increase in the rate means the crime is, incre the crime is increasing faster than the population is growing or reporting is increasing faster than the population is growing. So a crime rate may go up and it doesn't necessarily mean that crime is increasing. You also want to make sure you understand exactly what the UCR means by a particular crime. So up until 2011, rape, as reported in the UCR, is only of a female. No male victims are included in that data. So you'd want to be careful comparing data after 2011 and data before 2011. Now, this is arrest data that's compiled from the police, and the police report it to the UCR, and they report it on a monthly basis. Now, it provides the number of crimes known to the police, the number of crimes cleared by arrest, the number of people arrested, and characteristics of those people who were arrested. Now, clearance and arrest data, clearance just means um, that a crime is considered solved, provide information on the extent of delinquency and trends in delinquency as well. So as I mentioned, we've got a part one, and we've got part one, the index crimes, and we just talked about what those are. Okay, the FBI reports crimes known to the police and clearance and arrest data. Part two offenses are 20 additional offenses that you can see here. Some sex offenses, um, prostitution, loitering, etc. And for this, they only report arrest data. Now, the UCR used to do what's called a crime clock, where it gives a snapshot of the number of crimes occurring in a given year. The UCR also uses what's called a hierarchy rule. So say you commit several offenses at once, only the most serious out of a series of events is recorded. So say somebody trespasses onto campus property, um, they break a door, they enter a classroom, and they punch someone in the face, and then they steal something from them. Only that aggravated assault is going to be recorded. Now, they also report what's called exceptional clearances. These are crimes that are cleared, but no arrest has been made. But they're allowed to be cleared because they know who committed the crime, but they're unable to make an arrest. Either that offender has fled, they've died, they're outside of the jurisdiction, something beyond the police, um, police officer and police department's control. The UCR also divides the country into four regions, northeast, south, west, and midwest. This is basically just geography. Now here we can see the 2016 crime clock statistics. It's telling us how often particular crimes occur. So a violent crime occurs every 25.3 seconds and a property crime occurs every four seconds. There's one rape in the US every four minutes. Now keep in mind that's just reported rapes, okay? There's one murder every 30 minutes and one larceny theft every 5.6 seconds. Now, as I mentioned, clearance rates are also reported. These are crimes that are considered solved. It doesn't mean that there's been arrested, prosecuted, convicted, or incarcerated. It means the police are reasonably certain that they know who committed the crime. Again, you can clear by arrest, which would mean an offender was arrested, 
or you can clear something exceptionally. You can see here from 2017, the percentage of crimes cleared by an arrest or an exceptional means. So murder has our highest clearance rate, followed by aggravated assault. Then when we get down to crimes like burglary and motor vehicle theft, you can see that there's a really low clearance rate for these offenses. Now, there's some advantages of these official statistics. They do represent approximately 95% of the U.S. population. It also provides us long-term information on trends in crime. We can look over periods of years to see where things are increasing or decreasing. And it does provide moderately accurate measures of certain types of serious crime. Now, the disadvantages, first of all, we have that dark figure of crime. As I mentioned, only about a third of all crime victimizations are reported to the police. There's also many crimes that don't have a quote unquote victim. So who would be reporting um, that somebody sold you drugs? It's also important to remember that it's really difficult for police to actually detect crimes on their own. Offenders are often not caught by the police. And even if caught or identified, they might not be arrested because police have a lot of discretion or there might not be enough evidence to arrest somebody. Police also sometimes make mistakes. Um, I looked at not UCR data, but NIBRS data, which we'll talk about in a minute, looking at statutory rape. And there were offenders listed in there as being less than one day old, a year old, three years old. Clearly a baby is not a statutory rape offender. It's probably someone is typing in age, they're typing in a two digit number, but only one number makes it in. Police also sometimes deliberately distort data. They will unfound crime reports. That's basically saying that that crime didn't happen. Someone reported a crime, but the police don't believe it happened. And they may reclassify things from a more serious to a less serious category. Um, and this is often done so that a city looks safer. And as I mentioned, we have the problem with that hierarchy rule as well. Now, in order to correct this, the FBI recognizes there's some shortcomings of the UCR and they decide to implement the National Incident-Based Reporting System, which is referred to as NIBRS. And this gathers much more information. And if you click on this link, you can see a video that will tell you a lot about how NIBRS actually works. So this is developed and it's voluntary and it coexists with the UCR. And by 2021, every state is going to have to report their data this way. Now, it has Group A and Group B offenses. Group A is 22 offense categories made up of 46 specific crimes. So many more crimes are covered in this. So I did a large study, as I mentioned, on statutory rape. You can't track statutory rape in the UCR. It's not a crime that's actually tracked there. There's also 11 Group B offense categories for which they only report um, arrest data. Here you can see our Group A offenses. So you can see under fraud, we've got a whole variety of frauds. Under assault, we've got a variety of different types of assault. You can see for sex offenses, we have forcible offenses, forcible rape, forcible sodomy, sexual assault with an object, and forcible fondling. And then we have non-forcible offenses, incest and statutory rape. So that's the only place you'd be able to study this using official, uh, official data. Because those are not, the, at least the non-forcible ones are not in the UCR. And then we've got our group B offenses, uh, peeping toms, disorderly conduct, etc. So only arrest data are reported for this. Now, um, before we move on to the NCVS, one more thing to know about NIBRS is NIBRS doesn't follow a hierarchy rule. For each um, incident that's reported to the police, that incident can contain up to 10 offenders, 10 victims, and 10 criminal acts. It also is an incident-based reporting system. So it's not just a summary of X many rapes, 10% of them were women, 90% were men. You can link victim, offender, and all the information of one particular incident together. So you can do more with this data than you can with UCR data. Now, how do we try to figure out what's going on in that dark figure of crime? Well, the National Crime Victimization Survey, uh, survey begins in 1972. And originally it's called the National Crime Survey. So this is a survey that's done of 60,000 homes every six months. And a home is in the sample for two and a half years. Okay. And it's based on victim self-report. And again, I recommend that you click on this link and watch this. 
So they interview everybody in the home who are 12 and older about their experiences as victims. And it covers seven of the eight index crimes. The one it doesn't cover is homicide because this is a victimization survey and we can't survey a homicide victim. It also doesn't cover arson. So sorry, it covers six of them because it's too difficult to measure. And many part two offenses are not covered because many are considered victimless. Things like prostitution, gambling, and drugs. It covers the characteristics of the crime, the time, the place, the number of offenders and use of weapons, victim characteristics, age, gender, race, ethnicity, marital status, household composition, and education, perceived characteristics of the offender, age and gender, circumstances around the offense, financial loss and injury, and patterns of reporting and reasons for not reporting. Now, this covers crime in a more limited way than the UCR. And while it's done by trained interviewers, there may be some variations in how one person interviews versus another. One thing that also happens is um, survey responders, right? So victims who are answering these questions may telescope events. If I asked you what happened to you six months ago, I'm recording this lecture in December. So now we're going back to June. You may think something that happened in May happened in June or something that did happen in June, you might think happened before that. Um, memories fade over time. And sometimes people um, lie. They either don't want to share something that they feel is embarrassing or they lie and say things happen that didn't. It also records only the most serious event when several occur at the same time. Now, again, reports can have faulty memory. Also something to think about with both the UCR and the NCVS is that as information moves up levels of bureaucracy, data may become corrupted or inaccurate. We don't get any clear picture on victimless crimes, white collar crime, high tech embezzlement and computer crimes. Um, also, it's important to note any um, footnotes in the data. So for example, the 2001 UCR does not include the 2,830 homicides from 9-11 because it's considered an unusual event and it would skew the crime rates. Now we can also gather what's called self-report data. I, we can ask people about their involvement with criminal activity and it works the same way a victimization survey works. We can ask about the extent of the delinquency, um, usually it's limited to like the prior year and they're often anonymous and confidential. Otherwise people probably wouldn't answer them. Now the major advantage is that that can provide estimates of all crime committed. We can ask people about why they commit offenses and how often they commit them. And we can probe more on their backgrounds so we can get richer information about offenders this way. There's three examples here in your book. Um, Sorry, actually, these are, I'm not sure if these are all talked about in your book. There's three examples here on your slide. Um, the Monitoring the Future survey is one that has been done every single year. Um, and what it does is uh, it surveys 8th, 10th, and 12th graders about a variety of things, but reports annually on patterns of drug use. And if you click on any of these um, hyperlinks for each of these surveys, it'll bring you to information about that survey. Now, there's some problems with self-report. First of all, how truthful are people? Well, we can use different methods to try to estimate that. Say we're surveying um, people that are in a correctional population. We could try to compare that with official records. Um, if we were asking people about drug use, we could also drug test them. Now, the research tells us that data is moderately accurate. People are reasonably honest. And there's a minor level of underreporting for serious offenses. It's also difficult, though, to estimate trends because few of these are nationwide and few of them are long term. They also tend to underestimate serious crime. Um, respondents often underreport that and uh, report trivial acts. So a lot of times they're not asking about more serious behavior. They tend to focus on delinquency and minor offenses. They also tend to undersample the most serious offenders. So a lot of times self-report surveys are administered in schools and students who are delinquent or truant are most likely to be serious offenders and they're unlikely to be present in school to be surveyed. 
Now, there's been three major shifts in crime rates. Um, one is from the 30s through 1959, where crime decreases sharply because we have young men entering military service. Okay, our most crime-prone years are the teen years. And so whenever that uh, mid to late teens to early 20s population changes, if it gets larger, the crime rate gets larger. And if it gets smaller, the crime rate gets smaller. Now, all of those young men return from war and we get the baby boomer generation. We see a big increase in, um, as those folks come home from war, they have babies. As those kids grow up and become teenagers, we're going to see that crime rate um, go back up again. It also happens to coincide with some really turbulent years, the Vietnam War, civil rights, and a lot of drug use. Now, in the 1980s, we see a very brief decline. Um, and that's because the baby boomers start aging out. That's what we refer to that idea that people start offending in their mid-teens and they age out in their late teens, early 20s, That's um, or they stop offending it during that time period. We refer to that as aging out. Now, the 90s, we see up until pretty recently, decrease in most major crimes, okay? There's a lot of new laws, expanded justice system, a lot more funding. We're also starting to do a lot more evidence-based um, policies. And situational crime prevention, which we'll talk about in more detail in another chapter, but is essentially improved security measures. So things we can do to make a target, um, you know, a potential victim less likely to be a victim. Now, recent evidence suggests that decline in crime is ending. We could be on the cusp of a new cycle of increased criminal activity. This is due to things like um, a less stable economy, increased joblessness, prison closures, budget deficits, and copycat crimes. Also, we have more random mass shootings and an increase in cyber offenses. Now, I'm just going to end up talking about evidence-based criminology. Evidence-based criminology is the idea that we want to use rigorous social scientific techniques to develop knowledge in this field. It's the idea that policy should be based on what does research tell us causes offending and what tells us what works. Okay, ideally we want to have social policies be effective because they're based on science. We also want to think about translational criminology. How do we take our research, those of us that are criminologists, and how do we get that disseminated to folks that make policy? And how do we translate that into practice? And that ends chapter one.